You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 49. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, it's been a long time between episodes, but we're going to rectify that. I've been so busy over on my YouTube channel, which is cheeseman.tv, that I have been neglecting my podcast. And for those of you who were regular listeners, I hope you'll come back again and uh, listen to some of the cheesy facts and listen to me answer some of the questions uh, that uh, fellow curd nerds have written in and uh, and asked me. Now, I'm going to change the format just a little bit. Um, I'm going to omit the news section of the of the podcast um, because I want the podcast content to be evergreen. Uh, evergreen basically meaning that it could be listened to any time of the year or any any year to that matter. So it's going to be mainly question-based now, and we'll have a main topic or a main question, uh, and then I'll answer a handful of either written or um, voicemail questions that you can leave over at littlegreencheese.com. So the first question, uh, and this is the main topic for today, the question's from Margie Ahern, who I had the pleasure of teaching a cheese-making course. She flew all the way down from Queensland She happened to be a student on my beginner's cheese making course. So here's a question. Hi, Gavin. I love your tutorials. My raw milk is goat's milk. I tried the chili queso fresco today. The curd came together very quickly, so I didn't need to cook it for a second time. I have it under a weighted press now, so we'll see what another 48 hours brings. I have ended up with three litres of whey, so we'll try a half recipe of whey ricotta. Do you have any advice regarding goat's milk cheeses? Well, I do, Margaret. I've been doing some research. Even though I don't have any goats myself, I thought that the listeners would appreciate the uh, some facts about different types of milk. Now, here in Australia, it's difficult to get your hands on um, commercial goat's milk. And by commercial goat's milk, I mean that being processed uh, by dairy or a a combination of dairies. There seem to be a lot of um, small flock goat herds around, and it seems like a lot of people also have, you know, one or two milking goats. So let's talk about the differences between cows, goats and sheep's milk, because I know a few of you out there do have um, milking sheep, and uh, you often ask, how do I convert the, the recipes that I have in, in my book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, or any other cheese-making book for that matter, that mainly stipulate cow's milk for their recipes. Now, before that, um, even in between cows, different varieties or b- different breeds of cows, there are different uh, fat contents or milk fat contents or solid contents um, to the milk. For instance, the normal standard cow milking cow these days is a Holstein cow, uh, better known in the old days as a Frisian. These cows normally have a fat content in the milk between um, as low as uh, 3.2% all the way up to about 3.6% of solids in the milk. Compare that to, say, a Swiss brown or a Jersey cow, they normally have a milk fat content of about 5.5, massive amount of uh, solids in their milk. And basically, there are milk producers that have these types of cows specifically for cheese making. So how do cows compare to goats? Well, the pH of, or the potential hydrogen or the acidity of uh, goat's milk is a little bit higher uh, than what cow's milk is, and indeed sheep's milk is. Um, Cow's milk normally has a pH of about 6.7, but goats have a pH of about 6.4. They have a little bit more fat content, between 4 to 5%, 
and uh, the total milk solids are about the same, um, about 12.4. Now compare that to sheep. Now sheep have a pH of sheep's milk, sorry, not sheep themselves. <laughs> sheep's milk about 6.7. They have a fat content of about 7%. That's a lot of solids in sheep's milk. So the yield for goat and uh, sorry, goat's milk is about equivalent to uh, that of cow's milk. Um, however, sheep's milk takes the cake and you get a very high yield um, out of your cheese. There's a few things to remember if you're using goat's milk, and, and, and I'll, I'll stick to goat's milk now because sheep's milk is difficult to get here in Australia and probably a little bit easier in Europe, but not so much here. So goat's milk has a lower pH, as I mentioned. So that means that you'll need to reduce the amount of rennet when you are uh, using goat's milk as a substitute for any of the cow's milk recipes. And then you can reduce that by between 15 and 25%. So reduce the, the rennet amount. So for instance, if a recipe calls for, say... Um, 3.75 mils, which is three quarters of a teaspoon of rennet, you would use just slightly more than half a teaspoon or 2.5 mil. So, and so conversely, if you have a goat's milk recipe like, say, feta, and it's specifically made for goat's milk, then don't forget to increase the rennet amount um, by 15 to 25% if you're going to use cow's milk. Now, another property that a goat's milk has, it has finer fat particles than cow's milk. So you'll find that you won't necessarily get a cream line, so cream separation um, in goat's milk. It's naturally homogenized. The cream doesn't flow to the top. So that's the main thing to look out for if you're going to use uh, goat's milk. Like I said, add a little bit less rennet. Um, you won't need as much if you're using a recipe specifically for cow's milk and you'll find that you won't get a cream line. So you don't really need to add any more cream to goat's milk because you won't see the difference anyway. So Margie, I hope that answers your question in a roundabout sort of way. Just a one point, anybody who's buying goat's milk that has been commercially prepared in a carton, just make sure that you check whether it has been ultra-pasteurised. I got caught out in the first cheese I made with goat's milk, I bought some some goat's milk in a carton. It had been reduced. The price had been reduced, so I snapped it up. However, when I got home, I found that it was ultra-pasteurised, so it wasn't any good for cheese making. Anyway, I made some very nice goat's ricotta, got goat's milk ricotta out of it, but uh, I couldn't get it to set a curd. So just be aware of that in the region that you're in. So on with some other questions. So that was the main one. We talked about goat's milk. Let's uh, hit the emails and find some more. Sandra asks, what's the point of sterilising all of your equipment if, you, if the container or the spoons or your hands or anything else that you scrape the cheese with um, has not been sanitised? Can't those all be contributors to bad bacteria? Well, good question, Sandra. All of the stuff that I do use in all the videos that I show and, and in my normal cheese making process, I sanitize my hands using, um, I wash them with soap and water first, uh, warm, so warm water and soap, and then I sanitize them with vinegar before I touch any cheese whatsoever. So vinegar will kill, you know, 99% of um, most of the bad bacteria anyway. So it's you know, if you've got bad sanitation and your kitchen's filthy and you haven't cleaned it in a long time, yeah, sure, they may be contributors to bad bacteria. But if, you know, we've sanitised all the containers and all that sort of stuff, even if it's a sprayed with vinegar, uh, white vinegar, then you're fairly safe. Remember, we're in the home environment. We're not in a hospital that has super bugs or super bacterias. Most home kitchens don't have... <laughs> too many potentially bad bacteria that are going to wreck your cheese and make people ill. You know, of course, if you've been to, just been to the toilet and you haven't washed your hands and you shoved them in the cheese, then of course you're going to contribute to bacteria. But if you 
you know, wash everything, sanitise everything by boiling or using white vinegar, then you won't have too much of an issue. Good. It's, it's all relative, really. Well, thanks for your question, Sandra. Uh, the next question is from Pete, and he asks, do you reuse the cheese wax after you take it off of your hard cheeses? Well, Pete, yes, I do. Basically, what I do with the cheese wax I've taken off of the cheese, I rinse it off in um, in hot water. It doesn't actually melt the, the cheese wax, but I'll rinse it off in hot water and with just with a clean cloth and try and get if there's any cheese bits or what have you in the in the wax, then I, I get that off. Uh, and then basically I um, pop it into my wax melting pot and I melt the, the wax back down again. And I just make sure that if there are any bacteria or unwanted yeasts, I heat the wax up to 90 degrees Celsius. So 90 degrees Celsius will kill most of the bacteria that uh, is in the wax. So and then I'll uh, basically, once it's all melted, I'll then dunk in the uh, the next wheel of cheese and go from there. So that's how you basically reuse your cheese wax. It's a recycling at its ultimate. It's a, it's a very good way to, pardon the pun, very good way to use your cheese wax to last a very long time. In fact, the first one kilo of cheese wax I ever bought is still in use after um, all these years, and I've been making cheese since 2009. Thanks for your question, Pete. The next question is from Wayne. Wayne says, so general, generally speaking, is cheese salt simply salt with no iodine or is it different in another way? In other words, will any non-iodized salt work? Yeah, Wayne, I suppose it does. Cheese salt is, um, is coarse grained salt with no iodine. You've got that right, no problems at all. However, there are so many different types of non-iodized salt in the market now. And remembering that we normally measure our cheese salt by volume using a, uh, a tablespoon or a teaspoon, you've got to make sure that some of the newer salts, and I know there's uh, flaky sea salt, which is very light indeed. You just about have to double the amount of salt if you're going to use that in, say, milling it into a cheddar or something like that. Uh, and the reason I know this is because I was making a batch of brine the other day. So I was using just uh, table salt, non-iodized table salt that had an anti-caking agent in it. Um, but for brine, it doesn't really matter. And it took, um, you know, the volume of salt was, well, sorry, the weight of the salt was 450 grams to two litres of water. And that gets you a saturated brine of about 18%. However, I had run out of normal table salt, a non-iodized table salt, and the volume of salt that I had to put in, I was using flaky sea salt, was nearly twice that of what normal table salt was. So yes, yeah, so you got to make sure that uh, the weight of the salt is equivalent to you know a decent size. So we're talking about, I'm just trying to think of the, the dairy salt or the, the cheese salt that I've got. It's about two millimetre uh, the size of the cubes of the of the salt, so fairly large cubes of salt, uh, of cri sorry crystals of salt, and so when they're sitting on the surface of the cheese, that they do draw out a heck of a lot more whey than really fine crystal or that flaky sea salt. So, simple answer is yes, cheese salt, and you can use any non-iodized salt, um, but just make sure that it does have big crystals. Okay. The next question, and which is the last question, is from Doug. And Doug said, I've been using a Junket brand Rennet tablet. Uh, the box on their website has no information regarding IMCU rating, which is International Milk Coagulating Unit rating. Um, he's going to call them tomorrow. He's having issues getting his curd to set. So the reason is... Junket tablets are not the same as cheese making rennet. Uh, junket tablets, for those who don't know, are uh, tablets where you make custard, or it's it's a turn milk into a custardy consistency um, just by setting it and then putting it in the fridge. It, it does have rennet in it, but it has such a minute amount 
that I wouldn't use it for cheese making. You'd be lucky if you you could make cream cheese out of it. I know when you make cream cheese, you only add, you know, a few, I think it's about four drops of rennet. So that'd be about the only cheese you could probably make out of it. The IMCU for a a junket tablet is about five, um, whereas the normal cheese making rennet that I use um, has an IMCU of about 190 to about 200. So you can see the difference there, and that's probably why you're not getting any curd set at all, or it just turns into custard. (laughs) So, yeah, don't use junket brand um, rennet tablets. They're for making junket, um, not for making cheese. So um, so go and find a cheese-making supplier similar to uh, the one we run at Little Green Workshops and uh, and check out, get some either rennet tablets or some uh, liquid rennet. Well, thanks for your question, Doug. Okay, that's all the questions we've got. Like I said, I was going to keep the episode um, short, focus on one single topic and answer a few questions. So if you like what you heard so far, I'm going to be producing um, quite a few of these episodes throughout the weeks and uh, we're going to release one a week and don't forget that you can leave a um, an iTunes review if you're listening via iTunes or don't forget you can leave a comment on the episode post on littlegreencheese.com Now for upcoming workshop dates uh, you can find these over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au You can also find copies of my ebook Keep Calm and Make Cheese A Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home um, at most ebook retailers and I sell it globally at littlegreencheese.com You can also find all of my cheese making video tutorials over at cheeseman.tv Yes, that's cheeseman.tv and that'll whisk you away to my YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows. <laughs>